Hi, welcome to our lecture on supranational organizations and what their implications are for the modern state. The slides are designed to accompany the textbook, People, Places, and Culture, and of course, Ms. Gallen, I'll be your host for the lecture. So, the first things we're going to talk about is we need to define what are supranational organizations and talk about some examples of them. And then what we're going to do is trace that evolution through time, specifically looking at the 20th century and 21st century. And then we'll end with talking about what does that mean for the modern state today. Okay. So, first things first, a definition. And this is one if it's not in your, if it's not on your vocab list, it should be. Okay, so a supranational organization is when you have three or more states that forge an association and form an administrative structure for mutual benefit and pursuit of shared goals. In English, what that really means is you get three or more countries that get together and they sign a treaty. Okay. And as part of that treaty, they put in some kind of a structure to help enforce it with the idea being that everybody's going to benefit from it and that there's some kind of a goal that they want to accomplish through this organization. Okay. So key points there. One is three or more states. Two is that there's an administrative structure to it. Okay, so there's something monitoring how things are going. And then three is the mutual benefit and shared goals. Okay, so everybody has to be on board with this. Uh, we'll start with probably one of the earliest examples of a supranational organization. We talk about the League of Nations, right? And really the League of Nations, the big thing you need to know about it, you don't need to know a whole lot is that it's kind of the forerunner to the modern United Nations. Okay, it develops in the aftermath of World War I, and the general goal is to help prevent war by providing a place for countries to talk out what's going on. Right. Ultimately, it kind of fizzles out and dies a slow, painful death about 10 or 15 years later. Uh, World War II happens in, depending on where we're at, either the starting in the mid-1930s, the late 1930s, or the 1940s. We're talking about uh, U.S. involvement. That doesn't really start until the end of 41. Okay. And World War II, at any rate, ends in 1945, everywhere in the world. And from World War II, we revive this idea of having having a place where countries can talk about their conflicts and try and solve problems without resorting to the kind of total war and massive worldwide devastation that re was the result of World War II. And the result of this is what we call the United Nations. Okay. Also see it abbreviated the UN, and you need to know what the United Nations is. Make no mistake about it, you gotta know the United Nations. Okay. And the United Nations has a lot of, has its fingers in a lot of different pots, but at its base, at its base, it's really structured around a few key ideas. One is to maintain peace. Two is this idea of we can use economic pressure, we can use political or social pressure to bring rogue states in line. Okay. And then wars and military pressure is that last result. Okay. So the goal is, again, keep peace. Within that, then, it also ultimately it branches out to try and help modernize countries in a lot of ways. And so it's through that that we then get things like um, UNICEF, which is the United Nations, something, Children Education Fund, right? If you've ever gone trick-or-treating for UNICEF, for example, um, that's the United Nations with the UN Food um, Organization, the World Health Organization is a branch of the UN. Okay, so it's trying to kind of help everybody out and maintain and increase living standards. We also get, um, I'm trying to remember what FAO is, I'm drawing the total blank. WTO is the World Trade Organization. Right, UNESCO, I forget what they do as well. WTO, by the way, is another one you should know. The other two, FAO, UNESCO, probably not so much, but WTO, you should know. And the whole goal of the WTO is to kind of set worldwide trade regulations to minimize trade barriers and to, as a result, ultimately increase the standard of living for everybody. Okay. So these are worldwide organizations, by the way. 
Um, when we say worldwide, the United Nations, for example, is 193 members, and I think the WTO is something in the neighborhood of 150 these days, okay, or 160, something like that. So really worldwide. Then we get into kind of our regional supranational organizations, which are to say that they include just small areas of the globe. Right, so these might be, for example, the Benelux region, which is um, Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Belgium are the three, and they kind of start teaming together. Um, and a lot of this, especially when we're talking about Europe, comes out of the Marshall Plan, which is also a result of World War II, and we'll talk about um, some other results of World War II and some other supranational organizations that come out of this. Um, but the Marshall Plan is, in essence, the U.S. plan to rebuild large parts of Europe in the aftermath of World War II. And the thing you have to remember is in World War II, literally whole cities, whole industrial cities, are just bombed back to the Dark Ages. Like, very few buildings standing. Europe's industrial capacity is reduced basically to zero across almost the entire continent. And so what the U.S. does is the U.S. basically agrees to um, lend various European countries money with which they will then buy U.S. goods to rebuild their own economies. Okay, so it's a virtuous cycle, as it were. It's a big piece of why the U.S. flourishes as much as it does in the middle part of the 20th century. Um, out of the Marshall Plan, and as the Marshall Plan fades off, then we start to see... Um, Ultimately, the Organization for European Economic Cooperation, which becomes um, the European Economic, I think it's the European Economic Area, okay, which ultimately in the early 90s turns itself into the EU. Okay. And the EU is kind of a funny place because they're kind of trying to get to a place where the U.S. is, but they started, they start from a very different place in that when the U.S. got its start under in the aftermath of colonialism, really we had a, there was a lot of commonalities, right? There's common language, there's a common culture in a lot of ways, right? The EU is not starting from that same place, but what they're trying to do is build towards better, greater economic and social integration through um, treaties and things like that that make that economic integration happen slowly but surely as they change rules. They've got, for instance, the Schengen Zone, which is um, mean, which are countries where you don't have to stop at borders. Um, they've got the Eurozone, which shares a common currency. Right. By the way, not all EU member states are part of the Schengen or part of the Eurozone, but the Euro has emerged as a significant global currency, and it's emerged as a significant global currency really in my lifetime. Right. So I remember, I think it was in college, when the euro came out and a bunch of countries gave up their independent currencies. Okay. Um, just to give you some idea, the next couple of slides are maps. So we looked at member states, the United Nations, right? We, we've got those charter members are in orange. That means the people who started it in 1945. Okay. Then we've got um, member states after 1945, and then there's a handful of non-members. Okay, and you'll notice there's only two, maybe three countries that I can spot on there. By the way, if you're more interested in this map, it is in your book, so you can actually look at it a little closer with what the member dates are and things like that. Uh, but there are for sure some trends you might spot as you look at those dates. Right, so for example, Eastern Europe, where you can kind of see that stripe between Western Europe and Russia, right, that, when you look at those dates, those are all going to be the early 90s. Okay. Um, if you look at most of Africa, those dates are going to be really the 50s and 60s for the most part. You might dribble into the 70s. And what these are, right, so with Africa, it's post-colonialism when countries are, are being created and coming into their own, and so they're joining the UN, and that's kind of one of the ways that they can say, hey, we're free, we're part of the members, you know, we're part of the nation of world communities, is by joining the UN. And the same thing in Eastern Europe, only it's in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so we have a bunch of, of countries that are made, really, again, since I was your age about 20 years ago. Um, and then we've got a few other exceptions in Asia and things like that. And those, again, aftermath of colonialism. So really those dates we'd be looking at 
probably for most of those, I'd imagine, are going to be the 50s or maybe the 60s, potentially as late as the 70s if we're talking about um, Vietnam and things like that. So just some things to keep in mind. Um, this map, which is also, by the way, in your book, is a map of selected supranational organizations, and it's kind of hard to read. Anywhere you see stripes, by the way, that means that there's there are members of multiple organizations. Some ones that I want to make sure that you know, though. Okay. One, you should know the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Okay. Who they are and what they do. Um, you should know probably, let's see here, the European community. Um, and you should know NAFTA. Okay. That's the US, Canada, Mexico. For sure, you gotta know NAFTA. Um, I'm trying to think of what are the other big ones you should know. But there's some that aren't on here. You should know NATO. Okay, you need to know the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. That is one of those ones that comes in the aftermath of World War II and continues to play a huge role in the world today after some adjustment period. Again, you got to know what the WTO is. You need to know what the United Nations is. Um, and you should have some idea about regional trade blocks. You don't need to know all of them. You don't even need to know all of the ones listed here. Okay. But it just gives you some idea. Most countries are involved in one. Many countries are involved in two or three or more. Um, and some of these organizations are overlapping. And that's important to remember, too. So some of them, for instance, the whole point is to combine multiple organizations and try and kind of knit them together. <clears throat> so we've talked about what are supranational organizations. We've looked at some examples. Um, and now we're going to talk a little bit about what are the implications for the state. Okay. So we've got, for instance, economics, right? The NAFTA, the North, Atlant uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement, CIS, which is sorry, the European Union. These are really they get their starts as economics. European Union is economics gets its start economically, but ultimately kind of takes on a life of its own and. In a lot of ways, they function like, kind of like a country, but not. It's this weird middle ground where the European government has some powers, but uh, state governments have a lot of powers as well. And so it's kind of this weird federalized system. Um, So there's economics organizations, you can find military organizations, we didn't talk about those all that much, but NATO, for example, is one, the Warsaw Pact, which uh, when it existed was NATO's opposite number in the Soviet Union in the aftermath of the Cold War. Okay. Um, other things to keep in mind, and this goes in particular with these economics ones, right? So what you see with these are deterritorialization. So in other words, um, as these communities come into place, what ends up happening is rules and sovereignty get moved away from the national level. And this is a big issue um, for a lot of people that are afraid of like that new global world order kind of thing. And so it kind of undermines the state's traditional territorial authority in a lot of ways because in an age of globalization, we can take and pick and pull from all kinds of different places. And it means that corporations can have supply chains that literally go across the world, right? There's also this issue of re-territorialization, which is a state moving to solidify control over its own territory. Maybe it tries to reinforce some of those rules. We're seeing this going on in Britain right now. They're, they renegotiated their treaty with the EU, and they're getting ready to have an in-out vote for whether they're going to stay in the EU or not. All right, so that's an example of re-territorialization. There's a number of issues that surround that, including immigration, um, is probably the biggest one, but I'm running short on time, so I'm going to wrap it up here and just remind you that what we did was we talked about what are supranational organizations, we looked at some examples of supranational organizations, and we've ended up, we've talked a little bit about what are some of the implications for the state, right? And again, it's kind of a mixed bag because it's good and bad. It helps raise standards of living in a lot of ways, but also means control moves away from traditional countries and things like that and into these bigger organizations and a lot of people have problems with that.
If you have any questions, please feel free to come see me, and I'd be delighted to answer whatever questions you have.